It was a seemingly normal evening in the city of Chicago. Like most cities, it was bustling with people, desperate to get home on this Sunday night to watch some late night television before the long workday of tomorrow. Chicago's sportcaster, Dan Roan, was covering some of the highlights of the Bears football game during his late night show called the nine o'clock news segment. He has been doing this segment for years, always the same on channel nine without error. Tonight, however, it would be different. Dumps it up the middle, right up to the 10, turn left to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown! McMahon and McKinnon, 14 nothing Bears, then the defense, which hadn't put up a sack in 12 quarters, finally did. The viewers were petrified. Their post-game football analysis quickly turned into the reason why they would be up all night. The unknown of what they just saw created a hunger to understand what exactly happened during the broadcast and why. But unfortunately for them, they were given no answers. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild. So what we're going to do is start over from the top of the Bears and tell you. Exactly two hours and one minute after the incident that night, a second broadcast interruption occurred. The citizens of Chicago were in for another treat. This time, it was on Channel 11 during a PBS viewing of a Doctor Who episode named The Horror of Fang Rock. As suddenly as before, the video would cut out once again. Feel the animals? Oh, yes. That is stupid. You should talk often with the old ones of your tribe. That is the only way to learn. I'll get you a hot drink, miss. Oh, I've done some dry clothes. <laughs> Since there was no one at the studio during the incidents, the hijackers would leave behind no evidence. The only thing that remained were the few recordings of the broadcast that only a couple of people took before the hackers vanished into the unknown. And just like that, they would never be seen or heard from again, disappearing into the cold Chicago night of 1987. The hijackers did their job well, even though they may not have reached as many people as they intended during the live broadcasts at night, the whole city of Chicago and even the entirety of the United States would know by the morning. In Chicago television stations, someone using sophisticated equipment managed to briefly and illegally override broadcast signals on WGN-TV and WTTW. Jack Connerty reports now that both incidents are under investigation. 
who's responsible for two acts of video piracy. Video pirate who raided two television broadcasts last night. Somebody uh, with some microwave equipment was able to interfere with our signal going to the uh, Hancock transmitter. Uh, somebody wants to get attention, what do they do? They go break into a uh, uh, television broadcast just to get attention, like throwing a brick through your window, so to speak. It may seem rather humorous, but there is more to it than that. For when this person is caught, he or she will face both civil and criminal penalties. But who is the person behind the mask, orchestrating the madness of this strange mystery? The infiltrator, dressed in a notable rubber mask and wearing a suit, looked remarkably similar to a famous character, and his name was Max Hedrum. This is Ma Ma Max Hedrum. Give me a wave, I love to see style. I also enjoy a good laugh. <laughs> no ordinary people like you and... Well, ordinary people like you oughtn't to be afraid to speak up for classical music. They must be out of their piss, piss, piston heads! Why does he do it? Why does he do it to me? He says to me, Max, who do you want on your show that's really fascinating and really special? So I say, easy. Severiano Ballesteros. Max Hedrum was a fictional character created to confront the system, to defy the rich and powerful who pull the strings behind the curtain. He was designed to be seen as the one newscaster that wasn't being manipulated to control the masses, who would speak his mind with no filter. As a famous person once said, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Max began in Great Britain, but quickly moved overseas to the US, where he swiftly found overnight success and a new audience to come with it. I do so hate seeing ordinary people getting wet in the rain. <laughs> anyway, I was driving along one day and suddenly one of my fans shouted, Hey, there's Max Hedrum! And it kind of stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, You're with me with your applause! Uh, Max Hedrum. Thank you, Max. We appreciate your uh, stopping by. Arguably, most importantly, Max would be carefully selected for the new Coca-Cola commercial in their war against Pepsi. This commercial would be a huge part of Coca-Cola's push to appear cooler to younger generations, something that Pepsi was excelling in at this time. He's so hip, 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 hip. He's new. He's an innovator of the round ball, 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 ball. That's deep. Dribble, dabble, dribble, dribble, dribble. Prince of the courts of swore. So cool. So much like new coke. And myself. Revolutionizing common thoughts of common people and what the game is all about. He's great. He's great. He's coming. Bye, bye. No. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. No. Bye, bye. No. No. I could have blocked that shot. 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 Sure, man. Although Coca-Cola's attempt would fall short this time, Max Hedrum was catapulted to a common household name. He turned out to be one of the funniest and craziest characters that came to life from the 80s, which proved to be a great accomplishment, seeing as how the 80s had some pretty great strides for pop culture and film. Even after the 80s, Max Hedrum would live on in references throughout the years. Strange movements, an audible muttering, a mask to conceal an identity. What do they all have in common? The narrative behind everything that happens in this video circles around the idea of the unknown. From the person's identity to their motives, the mysterious vibe to this incident brings more interest because people fear what they don't understand. Or in other words, people fear the unknown. A mask in essence is meant to hide the identity of the person. It can also be used to show emotion to the audience of a play, or more sinisterly, scare an unsuspecting victim. Or it can even be used to strike fear into the hearts of your enemies in the heat of battle. Based on information the other party gives, the brain plays a big role in the decision-making 
of whether a stimulus is a threat or not. If the individual wears a mask, makes strange noises, and produces concerning movements, chances are the brain will be unsure about this individual and believe it could be a threat. Their intentions are unknown, and their expression locked to the structure of the mask. Not being able to see their true face and expression can be terrifying. It almost makes them inhuman. It all circles back to the statement, people fear the unknown. Signal hacking, a television broadcast, is no joke. In the eyes of the law, it is punishable as a federal crime. Just a year earlier, an internet hacker with the name of Captain Midnight took control of HBO's broadcast to display this message to the viewers, supposedly in protest of their recent price increases. He was swiftly caught and arrested. With their recent successes, it is unsurprising that both the FCC and FBI launched investigations to find the people responsible for this Max Headroom broadcast hijacking. It is very serious and uh, we would like to uh, inform anybody who's involved in this type of thing that it is serious and that we will take every step uh, that uh, we can to uh, find out who is doing it. And once we have uh, determined that, we will make sure that uh, the full extent of the law is uh, carried out. The Assistant Chief of Field Operations for the FCC, Dr. Michael Marcus, would be leading this investigation. Dr. Marcus speculated that the signal disruptors would be on the north side of the city, near Chicago's skyline. Somehow, someone must have put their dish antenna between the transmitter tower. With good timing and positioning, he believes it could be possible. Unfortunately, Dr. Marcus would have to rely on the FCC team in Chicago, since he would be hundreds of miles away at his office in DC. To make things worse, the FCC team would be unwilling to put in the time and effort needed to fully investigate this case. So Dr. Marcus's hands were tied. There was not much more he could do to push the investigation forward. Meanwhile, the FBI was attempting to determine the identity of these individuals. They took to analyzing photos to find the person, and supposedly the female accomplice. The FBI's only source for the photos was still taken pictures from VHSs, which were donated by Chicago's residents to aid in the search for these hackers. The FBI investigation would quickly lose steam as well. Analyzing the pictures didn't do much besides determining that the location of the filming was probably in some type of warehouse or garage. Needless to say, both the FCC and FBI would lose interest. Their investigations would prove to be unsuccessful, and the trail to find the hackers would eventually go cold. It would only be a couple of weeks until people would begin to joke about the incident and the Fed's attempt to track down the people responsible. Did you see the FCC has already said they're going to analyze these signals and go right to the source and just put this guy out of business? Right across the hall. Those are the people who spent 10 years trying to make Steve Dahl talk nice, and they're going to shut this guy down? Yeah, no way. You bet. That's the news this Tuesday. We thank you for joining us. Make it a good evening. Good night. Decades would pass until the interests of the Max Hedrum incident would spark once again. This time, instead of the police attempting to track down what happened, it would be reignited by the users of the internet. Blog posts, YouTube videos, articles, podcasts, and much more would cover this once obscure topic. And now, more people than ever would have a stake in uncovering what happened on that cold night of Chicago in 1987. With the internet at their fingertips, anything seemed possible. Theories quickly began to surface about the Max Hedrum incident. One interesting theory was of Eric Fournier, a musician that could have possibly hacked the system to advertise for his new music video, but supposedly aborted the project when the police got involved. People began to believe it was him because of the similar types of bizarre videos 
that he made early on in his YouTube career. His name was soon cleared, as there was no solid evidence that he had anything to do with the hacking. All claims against him were just wild speculation. Since Eric had recently passed away, the internet took to asking some people that were close to him if they knew any information. His former bandmates cleared his name once and for all. They mentioned that there was no way he would be in Chicago at that time, and he had little to no knowledge about broadcast communications so there's absolutely no way it could have been him. Even after learning Eric had nothing to do with the hackings, the internet was still determined to find who was behind this. In 2010, one post in particular stood out alongside the others. A Reddit user by the name of B. Pogue had a lengthy post explaining that a few friends of his might have been behind the hijacking. J and K, the suspects, were given those names by B. Pogue to protect their identities, so any lurking FBI or FCC agents wouldn't bust them for their actions. J and K were brothers who were both active in the local 1980s computer hacking scene in the city of Chicago. Although B. Pogue only knew the brothers from a dial-up bulletin board online, he had the chance to go to K's apartment for a get-together. K lived with his girlfriend in Lagrange which is near the south side of Chicago. They usually had Jay over with them because he was severely autistic and needed constant care. The apartment was a disastrous mess, filled with old electronics, AV equipment, and random pieces of seemingly useless technology. While there, B. Pogue overheard the brothers speaking about something big that they had planned for the weekend. This piqued his interest. Later that night at the nearby Pizza Hut, B. Pogue asked them what they meant about having planned something big. One of the brothers just told him to watch Channel 11 later that night. This specific night happened to be the evening of November 22, 1987, the same night as the hacking. Although B. Pogue did witness the hijacking at 11 p.m., he initially forgot about the conversation with the brothers that night and was coincidentally watching that channel on his own accord. After putting two and two together, connecting the experience with the brothers and the incident that happened, B. Pogue believed that the brothers did in fact hack the station. He recounts thinking Jay must have been the Max Hedrum character because of the similarities between his scatterbrained personality, sense of humor, and how he had the same mannerisms as the Max Hedrum figure that did the hijacking. It would make sense that Kay would be the cameraman and Kay's girlfriend would be the girl with the fly swatter near the end. Even with skeptics, B. Pogue had a pretty interesting story. Some people believed him, while others didn't. But this wouldn't be the last they heard from B. Pogue. Almost three years later, B. Pogue made an update. This time, he had been able to meet up with Rick Klein, the curator for the Museum of Classic Chicago Television. With Rick's help, they reached out to some of the engineers and technicians who were actively working for Chicago's broadcasting community at the time of the hijacking. They yielded a wealth of information that would precisely detail what kinds of locations, gear, physical access, and station-specific knowledge they would have to know to successfully pull off this hack. After looking through all of the information from the interviews, this engineering-heavy perspective from the people who were there would make both B. Pogue and Rick conclude that the probability that the hack was an outside job is basically zero. This meant that the hack had to be an inside job. So B. Pogue freed the suspicions of both J and K. And just like that, there were no more great strides to find who was behind the mask of Max Hedrum. To this day, no one knows who the real Max Headroom hackers are. There simply isn't enough evidence to track down the people that did this. Even though the hack happened many years ago, it still doesn't make sense for the hacker to come forward, as it would probably do more harm than good. Who knows if they can still get in trouble for what they did, and it could bring unwanted media attention and scrutiny to their lives.
it simply wouldn't be worth the risk. So what can we deduct from the information available? Looking closer at the clips, there are some indications of it being pre-recorded. As you can see here, it appears that the footage was cut at one point, meaning the video could have been taped and edited rather than being live. Also, as mentioned before, the person behind the hacking incident was most likely an insider. So what probably happened that night was an employee snuck into the studio to play the two separate parts during the segments. Since they are an employee, they would probably be able to gain access to restricted areas with ease and have great knowledge of what to do to not get caught. To make things easier for the infiltrator, there was no engineers at the WTTW transmitter during the hacking. Had there been someone, this could have been prevented. But why would the hackers do this? Their intentions are unknown, although it's likely they had a vendetta against the television company for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't get a raise or were treated unfairly. It also could have been one of the first trolls, or possibly they could have wanted to damper the reputation of the network. Really, the possibilities are endless. No one truly knows how the hackers did it or what their intentions were. For now, in the unseeable future, the unknown signal hacker, disguised as Max Hedrum, would be forever ingrained in the ominous mysteries of the Wild Web.